Greetings, believers and skeptics alike. Paranormal M is here to challenge your perception of reality. Don't forget to subscribe, drop a comment, I'll write back, and turn on notifications to keep up with our latest mind-altering tales. We hope you're prepared for a reality-bending experience. Flashlight on my bedroom ceiling. So this is an experience that inspired me to seek psychological help. I was around 19 and 20 years old. I was living with my parents. I was not in a happy place in my life, and my family is very unhappy and aggressive. So while other stressful things were going on in my life, they didn't help, and I fell into a pretty bad depression. It felt like these emotions weren't my own. I chalked it up to disassociation. So during this time, I was thinking a lot about the dead and ghosts, and about my own death. I have OCD and my own death became an obsession. One night I had my television on and I was trying to settle down for bed. I had been having pretty bad insomnia. Hyper and insomniac, depending on the moods, I guess. Well, I'd been trying every measure to help me sleep. TV usually has a hypnotic way of getting me to fall asleep. But this night didn't work. Every show on every channel was relating to ghosts, ghouls, zombies, graveyards, dying, and death. The last straw was when even the nanny was morbid as fuck. Taking place in a funeral, I freaked out and turned off the TV. I was creeped out, so I surfed the net for a while until I finally started to feel myself fall asleep. It was 3.45 a.m. As I'm feeling myself sink into sleep, I suddenly wake up, alert and feeling like something is watching me. I see it in the corner of my eye on the ceiling. I turn my face slightly toward the ceiling above me and I see this turquoise-ish orb. It was about the size of a cereal bowl blinking. But the blinking was weird. It wasn't like a traffic light blinking, it was like as if an organism could blink. Like it were pulsating. If that makes any sense at all. Anyhow, I chalked it up to insomnia and I closed my eyes. About a minute later, I still felt the hair on the back of my neck standing straight up. I still felt as though I were being watched. I reckoned with my fear with my eyes closed. Okay, it's now been about five minutes since he saw that creepy thing. If you open your eyes and look, and it's still there, then fuck, I don't know, do something. So I do just that. I open my eyes and I turn to look. And it's there. And I get so freaked, I get ballsy, and I turn to where I'm laying on my back, and I stare hard at it to get a good glimpse. It looks kind of like a cell that has this creepy nucleus shape where the light's coming from, and then this wide yet thin halo of light around it. It always looked a lot like somebody was shining a flashlight at my ceiling, but I guess from the attic. It's as though my ceiling were paper thin. So basically, it looked like somebody was shining a flashlight through a laundry sheet that was hanging. Only that sheet was like the dimension that we live in. So as I'm staring hard at this thing, it starts dancing. It makes all these choreographed moves, figure eights. And to this day, it's the creepiest and weirdest thing I've ever witnessed. I fall into a trance for a couple of seconds as I stare at its dance. This is until I start to get sick to my stomach with anxiety, and I guess more or less, fuck this shit. I race for my nightstand lamp and turn it on because light kills all monsters, right? Right, guys? Anyhow, as I'm moving as fast as I can to turn on the light, the orb thing stops dancing and chases me to the light. I hope that I made it before the thing did. The next day I'm freaking out and finally tell my mom what's happening. And as I'm telling her, my dog goes into my room. I decide to follow him. He's sitting on my bed, which he never did, and he's staring directly at the spot on my ceiling where that orb thing was. So my mom saged the fuck out of that room. 
For the next year, I start having heavier sad feelings and thoughts that felt alien to me. Along with this, I'd have these recurring dreams that my body was dead, but my mind was still alive and intact. I'd be going through rigor mortis while my relatives ask me why I'm single, and I'd cut open my hand and no blood would come out. Instead, I'd just see graying, sallow, rotting flesh. Eventually, the death thoughts and rigor mortis dreams stopped, but the disassociation stayed with me for years. Following after that same day, I believe I suffered from Kotar's delusion, but I also sometimes wonder if that thing possessed me somehow. Anyhow, if any of you are familiar with or know what the fuck that thing is that I witnessed, please let me know. I've had a handful of other experiences with orbs afterwards, but before this night I never heard of or knew anything about them. Sorry, it's too long. Too long didn't read. I saw an orb on my ceiling and my dog investigated the place where the orb is the next day. And after that, I got Cotard's delusion. Also, I like to joke that orbs are the cherries of cigarettes that ghosts are smoking in the dark. I like that. They were dancing under the moonlight. So about nine or ten months ago, my friend and I meet up for drinks and food. It's a crisp autumn evening and there's a beautiful full moon out. We decide to go for a walk to compromise our very satisfied full bellies. My friend finds a park on Google Maps that's strangely close to us. It's strange because we've lived in this area and we've never seen this park before. Anyhow, we start to head over to it. As we're heading there, she starts telling me spooky stories about shrooming with a mutual friend and basically how while they were shrooming, they turned streetlights on and off with their minds at will. She swears that this happens. Then I discuss strange times when that's happened to me. But as we talk about this, a sort of, wouldn't it be weird if that happened now? Question pops up in her conversation. Then the streetlights actually start blinking on and off. This was just like we had discussed. And we willed it. And the night got eerily quiet. We reached the park, which is really just a big soccer field dipped into the earth in the middle of a neighborhood. The moon is gigantic large and more impressive than I've ever seen. I almost get giddy about it and strongly suggest that we sit in the middle of the field. At the center I bask in the brilliant platinum light, but I feel strange, as though I smoked a couple of bowls of some good weed. But because I've been on medication, I've been very sober for almost a year. I recall describing it to my friend as though I felt like a little tiny organism in a giant petri dish. I look around and the quaint field is suddenly huge. It's like the size of a football field. I begin to panic. I feel like something is terribly wrong. My panicking is visible to my friend. She asks what's wrong. I say the field seems like it grew to an incredible size, and the moon on top of it is making me feel like I'm tripping on something. She responds, Oh, I thought you were freaking out about those hooded figures over there. I look to the south, where the field starts to end and bend back up towards the neighborhood. There were newly planted trees, and these trees had shadows and some other strange objects that at first I thought were teenagers goofing around. But then they also became the trees. I couldn't decipher what they were and we sat for a while trying to figure it out. Eventually it became clear that they looked like hooded figures, and they were definitely moving, running side by side. At first I thought they were teens playing soccer or something, but they were hooded, and their movement seemed more choreographed. And even weirder, it looked like they were blinking from one spot to another, or perhaps glitching back and forth. 
we watched in kind of a trance. We walk out of the field towards the north side, and still loving the moon hanging out at the edge. For a while, we just relax, but still feel watched and look back into the field. This time, the hooded figures aren't on the southern edge of the field. They're actually in the field. They followed us. My friend, who's very composed and calm as a person, says, I feel like they're going to eat us. Which was her way of saying, we need to get the fuck out of here. So we booked it. A couple of weeks later, we returned to the park in the daytime to A, make sure the park exists, and B, see if maybe there really were trees and there were four rows of them instead of a crowd of shadow creeps. We get there and there's only one row of very small piney trees at the very top edge of the field. The nauseating terror we felt creeped back into us and we again book it out of there. My best friend and I, whenever we waited in a checkout line together, we would glitch the registers consistently. As an electronics wizard, here's two for the price of one. Prologue. Me, Bud Carl, takes his car to Ray, the mechanic. Need a ride back. I wait outside as Ray's busy with a customer and carb talk. My state is as follows. A few days before I ended up with a hundred or more chiggers up one leg. Itchy madness. That, and I've, well, I haven't eaten and I'm getting cranky. Keeping my civilized silence on, inside it still details twixt Ray and the customer. Carl's leaning on the wall beside the customer and he and Ray are behind counter. I'm in front of counter, on a stool, my foot on the front panel of the counter, applying stuff to my bites. Can't recall feeling particularly sour or anything, mainly waiting. Suddenly a sharp bang. It explodes from behind the counter. Instantly I recognize the sound as an electronic component explosion. I thought a capacitor. Twas a button cell battery in a pen light. It was on the other side of the panel from my foot. So everyone is naturally caught off guard with a silent, what was that? Except me. Instantly I stand up and I say, Ray, I probably owe you a bit of money or something. I'm really sorry. I'll just remove myself from the building. And with that, I left. As you can tell, this is somewhat normal. Here's the hilarious part. The customer evaporated. Apparently, that experience was too much for the poor guy and he hightailed it out of there. Hilarious. The shopping part. See, the thing is, Carl and I used to be roommates and go shopping together. Finally, the fifth time, with the entire store, took a power dip. Their battery backup failed. Everybody had to wait like 13 minutes for the server to restart. This was in the middle of us checking out our groceries. Every single time the two of us waited in line together, some thing would screw up. Mostly minor, but annoying. So this time, while waiting, we decided that this was getting ridiculous. One of us needed to go to the car, or at least go to a different line at a different time. That seems to take care of the problem. Now, living apart, we tested it a few years ago. Yep, had to enter the card manually. Shwe. Short paranormal experiences that I've had. 1. In 2008, my grandfather passed away. He had a shed about 50 feet away from the house, and we'd spend time in there. It had been about three months after he passed, and my cousin, she was three, she pointed over to the shed and said, Paw, paw. But it wasn't like a, is he over there? He normally is. It was like a, oh, there he is. And I said his name, and Papa's not there. 
but she insisted that he was standing in the doorway. Number two, not mine, but my sister's. She was four, so I wasn't born yet. Her great-grandfather had just died. They were very close. She went to sleep the next morning and told her mom, Granddaddy came through the window last night to visit me. My mom was so freaked out that all she said was, You tell Granddaddy that we come through doors in this house. My sister never saw him again after that. When I was two to three, my 16-year-old neighbor, who I loved, got killed in a car accident. I saw her multiple times when I was outside. I even told my dad, put me down, I want them to hold me. Obviously, she wasn't there, though. Four. When I was younger, we were very poor. So at one point, me, my mom, sister, aunt, and uncle, two cousins, and grandma, and grandpa... We all lived in a house together. The man that lived there before had died inside. He couldn't take care of himself, so someone was supposed to check in on him every single day. One day, people just stopped coming. He died sitting at the counter from starvation. It was because he literally just forgot to eat. Very sad. But every single person had paranormal experiences at that house. We didn't own a radio TV, but my mom heard music when she was alone. Once I had a nightmare, so I went to go to my mom's room, but when I got to the hallway, I could hear slippers shuffling around the floor in the hall. Yet, no one was there beside me. My aunt had an experience, I don't remember what, but she got so terrified that when she went to the neighbor's house to wait until somebody else came home, she couldn't handle it. Two Roses from Beyond I lost my very brilliant, witty, overachieving son to opioids almost five years ago. He was extremely intelligent, high IQ, a gifted student who graduated college in three years flat. He was self-sufficient with a great job, but a very dark, terrible secret. He became addicted to Oxycontin pills in college and managed to hide it for four years. His name was Andrew. He was an atheist. He didn't smoke and rarely drank. I found out about his addiction just five weeks before his death. I was able to get him to treatment, but he would only stay there 11 days and I was with him in his apartment in the last six days of his life. On November 10th, 2014, he gave me two red roses. Because you deserve these, Mom. Then I dropped him off at a double-A meeting. He didn't go to the meeting. He was found 45 minutes later unresponsive in a PetSmart bathroom with a needle in his arm. Since his death, I cannot remember exactly when it started. But I've had roses come into my life time and time again in many different forms. I moved to Portland, the Rose City. I adopted a cat. She was already named Rosie. I decided to start photographing two roses which appear frequently. I swear if anybody could figure out how to reach beyond the other world, it would be my brilliant son. They appear randomly and also on important dates, such as his birthday, my birthday, and Mother's Day. For example... On his birthday in 2016, I was at a thrift store the night before feeling sad, like a loser, really. I had lost my beautiful son to drugs. I frequently beat myself up over this. As I was leaving, I saw two red roses in a glass display case. It stopped me in my tracks, and I looked at it. I saw a little note. Pull my pin close to you, it said. It was a music box as it wound up and pulled the pin. It played Close to You by the Carpenters. The lyrics are as follows. On the day that you were born, the angels got together and decided to create a dream come true. Song about a birthday, of course I bought it. 
I planted a red rose bush for Andrew when I moved to Portland in 2015. It struggled and really never produced much. Last year in 2018, I noticed it had two buds. This bush produced two perfect red roses, side by side, that bloomed from Mother's Day to my birthday of May 26th. It had no other flowers that year, so odd. My other roses had dozens of blooms. I have countless other signs, sometimes roses, sometimes other unexplained events that leave me wondering. I'd like to post the pictures here, but maybe I have to do this in a second post. At any rate, this is my story. My sweet Andrew, forever 24. Forever loved and forever missed so very much. Creepy Possessed Toys Remember the times there were Furbies? Remember how it often was claimed that they were haunted or possessed? If you remember Furby, you may remember the super cute robot dog, Poochie. That a cute little bone you could put up to its nose and it would have these little lights that changed hearts and stuff as it barked out some cute little song tune. My experience was with this Poochie. Now I'm 30 and I got that pooch as a kid, around the time the first Harry Potter book was released, I'm pretty sure. Can't remember the year, but it was a long time ago. I loved that thing, until it started randomly activating and barking its tune. Always at 10 p.m. Eventually I got annoyed at the glitch and took the batteries out. Wouldn't you know it, a few days later I wake to its barking. No batteries. And yes, I checked to make sure mom hadn't put them back in. Every fucking night. So I got annoyed. Threw it into the bottom of my toy box and covered it with a lot of plushies. Helped muffle the noise. Then one day, Poochie's back on the shelf I'd kept it on. This became a cycle. I assumed the maid was one just kept putting it back on, but... What? One day in anger... It would react when I decided I wanted to play with it. I got so mad I threw it as hard as I could onto the floor. Broke an ear and a leg, but suddenly it worked again. My next frustration with Poochie came pretty short after, where I tossed him out of the second story bedroom window. This time his head had kind of popped. I took the batteries out, proceeded to put it back on my shelf. Did it creep me out by then? Yes. Did I still love it? Enough to not want to throw it away. Back into the toy box it went, and this time I asked the maid to not move anything in the box, and yet I would still wake up to its barking. I tried popping the head all the way off one night in frustration. It was still batteryless and the head hanging on by cables or wires. So I finally decided to throw it out. For months, it just kept appearing on my shelf every few days. Trow out and repeat. I think they mean throw. Don't know if Furbies are haunted, but there was definitely something weird about that dang robotic dog. La Santa Muerte does not want to be ignored. It was around the year of 2011. My parents had moved back to the US and I hated my first rental house. So my then boyfriend and I decided to look for other places closer to the main city. A friend we had in common and also the reason that he and I even met, they told us that she had a house for rent and that we could rent it for very cheap. Now, despite all my past weird and inexplicable experiences, I was still very much a skeptic. Paranormal? Bah! We knew she and her family very much believed in and prayed to their Saint La Santa Muerte. To not make this an even longer story than it already will be, I recommend looking her up on Google if you don't know who she is. 
Suffice it to say, she is often veneered by those wishing for money. I'm going to go ahead and say that they meant revered by those wishing for money and harm on their enemies. On to my story with her. A little description of the house as you walk in the front door on the left is a living room. Straight ahead is a corridor that holds the kitchen, the back door to a closed and mostly roofed yard. If you stand at the front door and look down the corridor, you can see through a window at the end of the kitchen into a small laundry room that is attached. The main bedroom was upstairs, and a guest bedroom next to the corridor, and below the upstairs bathroom. Now the scene is set. The heavy curtains were always drawn. No one was in that house. But we always felt watched. We lived there for around two months when things started to get very weird. My pets began acting odd. My parrot died and within, well, basically hours, was into heavy decomp. My ten-year-old dog with cataracts and minor hip dysplasia acted like she could see, had no pain in her joints, but she wouldn't stand in the sunlight. And so... My first weird moment was getting home from work every day. I was feeling like I was going to find another pet dead. I got home feeling something was off and quietly walked to the back door to peek my head out. Molly, the old dog, was laying unmoving by the door. No breath, no anything. I watched her for a few minutes and eventually, when I decided it was time to move her, as she was clearly dead, I made a noise. I watched as her chest area instantly expanded. She began to breathe. A few days later while I was at work, my boyfriend called me to tell me the dogs got into a fight. Junior had blood all over his neck from where Molly tore through him. He needed to go, so please hurry home. When I got there to check on them, sure enough, Junior had blood all over his neck, but without a single wound. Molly had no blood, but two deep punctures. One above the eye and one below her jaw. That night my husband and I sat down to talk. Something was weird. We would see a white veil and a face watch us through the laundry room. Pieces and corners of tiled floor would go missing without a trace. In the guest bedroom, water would drip onto your shoulders or head but none would ever reach the floor. I told him I was afraid to feed my own pets. We agreed that he would take care of them for a bit. Only a few days later on my way back upstairs from kitchen, something strong tried to push me down them. I managed to get upstairs and told him what happened. Remember, even at this point, we were both still non-believers. A day later, as we're laying in bed, he asks me if I'd noticed the ledge in the backyard area. The ledge had a picture frame and candles. I informed him that there was a frame laid down and two candles also on their sides, but I hadn't thought much of it. He said the frame was standing at the center with both candles positioned on each side upright. I asked what was in the picture. His words were not even fully out of his mouth. La Santa Muerte when the dirty clothes basket when the dirty clothes basket which had a click on top and a heavy pair of wet jeans laid over it to dry scared me into believing hmm. the top lifted up a few feet into the air and flew sideways into the wall I knew in that instant we needed to leave now so we prepared our things and went to stay with his sister. Turns out the reason our friends refused to visit was every time they walked in they felt something really off about the place. Apparently they hadn't wanted to tell us. The owner was very upset upon learning that we were leaving only five months into her contract. She said she had forgotten that portrait and the candles, and she felt ignored and abandoned. She only wanted us to leave her flowers and money as tribute. We noped right out of there. My ex went back to pack up, fell asleep on the bed, and was slapped awake by something there. After we moved, only a week after the dog's fight, suddenly Molly's wounds were scars. 
She was back to being her normal old, not good-sighted or mobility self, and I... I will never not believe in the paranormal again. In case anybody's curious about who La Santa Muerte is, here's a small little blurb. La Santa Muerte is typically depicted as a skeletal figure, often similar in appearance to the Grim Reaper, wearing a robe or a cloak. She's usually portrayed holding a scythe, which symbolizes her role as a bringer of death. Sometimes she may also be depicted holding other objects or symbols, such as scales representing justice, an hourglass symbolizing the passage of time, or a globe symbolizing her dominion over the world. She comes in various colors, each representing different aspects or intentions, such as white for purity and protection, red for love and passion, and black for empowerment and authority. And apparently the name translates to the Holy Death in English. La Santa Muerte originated in Mexico and is revered by some individuals, particularly in marginalized communities as a powerful and protective figure. Devotees often seek her help for various matters, including love, health, and protection. However, it is important to note that La Santa Muerte is not recognized by the Catholic Church, and sometimes considered to be controversial by some. At least that's due to her association with the aspects of folk magic and the occult. Changeling or just a weird, inexplicable change? My dog will be four in February and had hurt himself breaking out of his kennel. He's a shepherd mix, so very high energy and kind of crazy. A piggy eater. He quite literally ripped the metal bars off of his kennel right off. He forced his way through and proceeded to puncture and rip quite a few pieces of skin. Now there was never an infection, but here's where it gets weird. It had been two weeks since that happened. He's healing very well with only one of the five wounds left fully close. But one night out of nowhere, a week ago, he became extremely lethargic. My husband and I both checked on him throughout the night. We feared that he was not going to make it. He was in a heavy sleep and drowsy and uninterested in food or water. I had to provide him with a pet-safe electrolyte, sort of keep him at least hydrated. As on five days ago, he's alert, healthy in every possible way. But he's not the same dog he was. You see, he used to get excited, and I do mean stupid excited. Like every single time my husband got home, he used to sleep in the bed with us, and he was always so high energy if we didn't make out that day for a walk. He would usually pace for hours. He loved the dog park, and visiting my parents and their dogs responded very happily to any cue word that indicated a walk or a visit, or even food or potty. But now, since he came close to death and made it, he's very much a changed dog. Vet says nothing is abnormal. However, there's no excitement, no hunger or thirst unless I stand there and tell him to eat or drink. There's no interest or desire to even be in the same room as us. I took him to my parents today to see them, but... Maybe that would have cheered him up, but got nothing. An indifferent reaction to everything. Even his eyes seem different. Cold. The Mimic, the Imitator. What was with us? I worked at a boarding facility for dogs and cats. From day one, stuff was off. The first thing I noticed was, well, hearing a voice right behind me. When I turned around, seeing no one there, understandably enough, with 20, 70 dogs barking all around me for their lunch or playtime or potty breaks. I kept discarding these things until one day from the top of a low kennel, a partially filled water container like the ones you used to water plants with, and we use it to fill bowls. It flew at me. 
No way a dog could have hit it and sent it somehow flying horizontally at me. It missed me by like an inch or so. I felt the breeze of it flying past me as I walked by. It hit the kennel across from where it was located hard. I knew something was up then, but still hadn't paid much mind. Shortly after, I noticed the metal doggy door that led from each kennel into an outside run and it would start swinging when I entered the kennel to clean. Or for anything, really. I would look at the doggy doors. Okay, both other sides, no motion from them. But if I stepped out of the kennel, the door would stop swinging. Well, nothing new for me to experience weird shit, so what is one more story to add to the list, right? One day a coworker got mad at me and called me. She said she saw me through the window and asked why I didn't go back and talk with her for a bit. I answered with the fact that I wasn't, nor had I been anywhere near work that day. She thought I was kidding, went to the front desk to ask, and was told that no one, in fact, had been through at all for the past couple of hours. This happened three times with different co-workers where they would see from the other room or the yard and ask why I stopped to talk. And these were all days I wasn't at work. This eventually progressed. I was moving up to being like the bather, you could say, for our location. So a lot of dog baths and loud dryers going for the pups. I kept seeing every time I was bathing a dog and my manager and then friend and also the person whose voice I heard the most when no one was near me standing by my side. She would stand there, waiting for me to turn around and turn off the dryer so I could hear her. And once I did and turned toward her, no one would be there. She would be busy with clients or not even in the building. At this point, some of us girls had already been discussing the weird shit going on. One friend and I said, just roughly at the same time, Oh, the mimic. Oh, the imitator. We looked at each other and smiled nervously. We had never talked in depth about this stuff, because come on, how many people would even take us seriously? Turns out two other girls had heard or seen me or the manager more than once when we weren't there, or it simply wasn't us. Two more things stuck in my memory about this place. One, we had a storm which leads to power flickering on and off. And this would be from the reception to the back kennel area where most of the activity would seem to happen. It was visible through a large window so clients could see where their fur babies would be kept. But as the lights flickered, three of us stood at the reception past our shift in case we had an emergency. Two of us were facing that window. Both of us at the same time saw a fast, non-identifiable shadow thing rush past the window even at the higher top of the kennel doors, which, by the way, are six feet tall. We saw this twice during the light flickers. The second thing that stuck was this. We had radios. We just often forgot to use them or even turn them on. One of my coworkers was just outside with the daycare dogs. Dogs there just to play for the day. And that's when her radio clicked. A voice. She didn't recognize it. It said, Spot's mom is here for pickup, and then cut out. She went to answer only to realize her radio wasn't on. She got that dog ready and took him to the front, where the receptionist said she didn't call for him. She didn't have any radios on either. We still don't know what it was, and really what we experienced. But we do know it was out of the ordinary. Is this a real ghost encounter? Hello everybody. So basically, today I was in my washroom at about 12.40 at night, just doing my bong. And then my door, which was locked of the bathroom, kept on trying to open aggressively for five seconds or longer. I saw the door handle just failing to open every time at this point. I wasn't really freaked out, I just thought it was my parents' mom or dad, which they wouldn't even do it that aggressively. Then I thought it was my grandpa, who usually goes at night, but desperately, but I go out ten seconds later, realized it wasn't them, and confirmed this. I woke each and every single person in my run-on sentence in my household, asking everybody, said it was not them. Another thing to note, 
If it was my grandpa or anyone, I would hear footsteps coming up to the door, which I didn't hear. I had my headphones in, which made the volume lower, but no music or anything was playing. I saw and heard it clear as day, and after everybody told me it was not them, I was shocked on what this can be. 4.55 a.m. I am not asleep and I'm not planning on it. I go to stay in the washroom every day for at least 30 minutes at night. Never happened before, and usually if it was my grandpa, I would hear him go back and I open the door and there was no one. He's a slow walker. I would have saw him, and my parents were all asleep. They would never lie to me. This wasn't done by a physical being, and it made me more paranoid because of the weed, but my friend said I might just be tripping when I know that's not the case. I saw the door handle with my own eyes, and I saw it move. This can't even be a schizophrenic problem either. This happened and wasn't done by me or anyone in my house. I've never experienced anything paranormal and no one has died inside this house. I just don't see a real possibility of how this could have happened. Somebody tell me something. I've only once experienced something like this that was a rubber games moving, but I shrugged it off because they sometimes move for when putting them on the table randomly. I saw myself jump off my balcony. So this happened to me when I lived with a flatmate and worked nights. This one night I came back home around 2.30 a.m. And since my flatmate worked as ground staff and her shifts rotated every week, she was supposed to be home around 6.30 a.m. that morning. I had a private balcony, and because it was winter I kept it closed or my room would be freezing. I lived in a place that can get two or one degrees during winter, but that's it. So there was never quote-unquote heating systems in the house, but we did have room heaters. It was odd that it was open since I remembered closing it before leaving for work, but I chalked it off to my flatmate, perhaps. I closed the open door to the balcony, turned off the light outside, and gotten into my usual routine of taking a bath and changing for bed. It was about 3 a.m. by then, and when I hit the pillow, I fell asleep immediately. Now, this was out of the ordinary for me, since it always takes me a good hour to fall asleep once in bed. I didn't remember falling asleep either. I woke up about an hour later as I was really cold. I saw the door to the balcony was open again, and the lights were back on. I remembered closing it and turning the lights off very clearly. From my bed, I had a diagonal view to the balcony, so I can see anybody who may be standing there. Just as I was about to get out of bed, I saw something move out of the shadows where I couldn't see into the light. It was me, and I climbed onto the steel railings. And once on top, I or she turned her neck to look back directly at me, smiled a little too wide for human beings. She had too many teeth. Then she jumped off the balcony down to the fog. I was frozen. Not that I couldn't move, but more like I was in shell shock. I got up from bed shakily after a couple of minutes, freaked out of my mind. I just closed the door and turned off the lights outside again. Didn't sleep for the rest of that night. I still don't understand what I saw to this day, but it always inspires a chill down my back when I think back on it. I haven't seen her again since. Spooky. The Devil Tried to Take My Soul As a teenager, I was heavily into witchcraft. I was born from a family of witches, and it was in my bloodline as a teen. Again, I didn't know how serious my actions would become. I had four friends. They all had the same interests as me. And we have what you would call sort of our own little coven. We had done plenty of spells and seances prior to meeting a new guy at our internet cafe. Which were very big when I was in high school. If you wanted to get on the internet, you had to sit in the cafe and order some coffee. 
You could be on there as long as you wanted to anyways, but back to the point. We meet this guy in the cafe and we're all starting to talk about our stories of supernatural occurrences. The guy, we're going to call him Jason, said, Hey, you all should come to my house. It is haunted. And I guarantee you will be able to see ghosts there. I don't want to change the story, but since a child I had this... Well, I have just basically been haunted by ghosts. One of the houses that were haunted that I used to go to all the time was my dad's best friend's house. I actually almost drowned in their pool once. But that's for another story. Anywho, we're walking down the block toward his home. No idea where it actually is. Then we got hit with it. And he says, this is my house. I look over and realize it's my dad's best friend's house from when I was a child. I didn't even realize they'd sold the home. Really thought they still lived in it this day, but clearly here it was no longer occupied by the family. I chatted and I told all my friends and the owner how they used to be my uncle's house, but... How I knew that it was haunted from experiences I had... Well... I was still too naive, really, to understand how serious things really were. As we stepped into the house, memories flooded back to me all the times, running up and down the stairs in my rainbow bright pajamas. I was afraid to walk down the hallways alone, always afraid to be alone no matter what. But such a beautiful home. His mother was there, and she seemed okay with the fact that we were there and what we were going to do at the time. In fact, she even smoked a J with us. Not a good example of a parent, but hey, we were kids. We didn't care. Eventually, Jason decided to lead us upstairs to his room. And as we approach his room and walk toward the door, he opens it. I see swords hanging everywhere all over the walls, and he has two big aquariums filled with snakes. He persists to tell us how he likes to do magic with the snakes as well. He pulls a large sword off the wall with a beautiful red ruby in the middle. I look at it, and I'm saying to myself, Wow, that's a beautiful sword. I start to gain excitement, but at the same time, there's this feeling in the pit of my stomach telling me something's not right. I'm sure it was the fact I knew the house was haunted. So Jason grabbed a sword, and he said, All right, we're going to the attic as we made our way up to the attic. The first thing that I noticed was the large mirror centered in the attic. All of us could see a reflection as we walked in. He asked us to go to the further side of the attic, where there was nothing at. Hmm. He told us all to lie down in a circle, and that he would lie in the middle with his sword, and that's how we would gain the magic. As he began to chant, I don't remember really what the words were that he was saying, but I remember all of us repeating them at one point. And as we were repeating the words... Something told me to open my eyes, so I opened them. I notice a large light above my head, purple and orange and green swirling all around me. I look over to my friends and I realize I can see all of their auras above them in this moment. And some of them green, some of them orange, and one in the middle for Jason was pitch black. I got a little scared at that point, I didn't know what to think. I'd never seen anything quite like that at that time, so I was very confused. My eyes were open, my concentration was lost, but everybody around him was still chanting. Finally, I heard a raspy, demonic voice say very ominously, Fallon, I need something from you. My body shivers and I dare not ask what he needed from me. I knew what it was, but why? Why couldn't I just get up and leave, and that second I just had to ask what he wanted? But my voice shivered, and I said, What? What do you want? What do you want? A large amount of time seemed to pass, but it was only seconds. Then an ominous, demonic, grumbling voice said, I want you to give me your soul. In that moment, I completely freaked out. I jumped up, run for life. As I get downstairs, I realize none of my friends are behind me. Nobody else around, nobody else seemed to have heard or seen what had happened. It was like they were all in, like a type of hypnotic state. His mother asked me what was wrong. I began to explain something wasn't right with her son. 
She said, oh no, not again. You already know when you hear that song, you're already nervous again. I asked for the second time that night when I probably shouldn't have. What do you mean by this? She said the last time he got like a couple of weeks ago. He literally threw this dining room table at me. It was like a humongous wooden dining room table. Mind you, this kid was probably five foot four, maybe 189 pounds, soaking wet. There was no way he was throwing a wooden table at his mother. I started to get nervous, but I didn't want to go back upstairs to get my friends, but I was afraid for them. So I prayed. The only thing I knew how to do, so I just prayed. I prayed that they would be okay. I prayed that they would come down quickly, which seemed like forever. But in reality, it was 30 minutes that went by and they all came downstairs. They were laughing and talking as if nothing had happened. Not noticing that our new friend Jason's eyes were pitch black and he wasn't himself. He sat down on the bench by the stairs and stared into the floor. Making a deep moaning sound, my friend asks where it's coming from. I say horrified in his mouth. I said, it's time to go guys, we gotta go. They all seemed to follow behind me, not really caring why I wanted to go as... Well, as we get outside, I start to tell them everything that happened and ask them why didn't you guys stop? Did you not see what happened? They all looked at me crazy, what are you talking about? We didn't even know you left. I knew at that moment that they were in some evil hypnotic trance. Told them we could never hang out with this kid again or be around him. Something wasn't right. That was the first of many stories that sent me into a deep depression. I wound up trying to unalive myself at the age of 17. If it wasn't for me finding a faith in spirituality, I probably wouldn't be here today. But I fought evil, and I will continue to prevail against it. I almost died at six, the first of many to come. So I was six years old when my parents first bought our first home. It was a beautiful home. They'd bought it in the suburbs. At that time, it was me and my three brothers and my sister hadn't been born yet, so my mom and dad bought a beautiful three-bedroom home. I was able to have my own room for the first time, and my brother shared a room since I was the only girl at that time. My mother bought me a beautiful pink canopy bed, made everything in my room pink for me. So I was super excited to have that at the time, because up until that point we lived fairly poor. I always loved our house, but for some reason, even as a child, I never felt like it was real or like it was really my home. I don't know if it was my psyche trying to prepare myself for what would happen, or if it was something else. I don't have a lot of memories of that home, but the ones that I do have were all good up until the last memory. And that was a particular day that my mother, who's friends with a neighbor across the street who also had three daughters, would take turns babysitting. They would specifically take turns babysitting each other's children if they had things to do. So this particular day, my mom had to go to a grocery store down the street, so she asked her neighbor to watch us kids. As I got over to the neighbor's house, my mom had only been gone for maybe what seemed like 30 minutes, I think. I had to use the bathroom really bad, so I kept trying to get my neighbor's daughter out of the bathroom, but they weren't going anywhere anytime soon. At that time, a teenage girl, and probably not now, but does anybody else find this confusing? But definitely at that time, a teenage girl spent all of her time in the bathroom when she was at home doing her hair, or makeup, and talk on the phone, whatever else you can think of. But I could not get in the one bathroom that they did have. So I told myself, I'll just run across the street and use my own bathroom during this time. Again, it was the 80s. Still, people didn't really lock their doors back then, so our doors were always open. And as I walked into the house, I decided to get myself a popsicle out of the freezer. I made my way to the bathroom adjacent to the kitchen. I took care of my business, washed my hands, and something stopped me. Something gave me this weird feeling that something wasn't right. But I was six years old, so what did I know? 
So I began to walk out of the house and I got about halfway across the street and I heard a huge, loud boom noise. I turned around and the windows of my house were blown out. There was fire shooting from the windows. I was looking crazy, like, what? How is my house on fire? I was just in it and I didn't smell anything. That's like smoke. I didn't feel anything different, and for me to have been in the house and the fire to have been that severe to blow out the windows was crazy. Even to my six-year-old brain, but you would think that there would have been some type of sign that there was a fire in my home. I watched in horror as my home was engulfed in a blaze of flames. By the time I ran over, even thought about running over, rather than to tell my neighbor, she was already running across the street trying to grab me from getting hurt at that moment. My mom was actually walking up the hill with bags of groceries because at that time the store is right down the street from our house. That way she used to walk there, she used to get closer, all I could do was cry. We did not even have insurance on her home at that time because my parents couldn't afford it. And I don't think they thought that their brand new house would be in flames within a year of buying it. We end up finding out later that it was an electrical fire that happened and it started in the walls. Which is why I may not have smelled it to this day. I've only been in one other fire and it was nothing like that, but to me it was definitely something paranormal about it. And how it happened. So I'm just glad that I'd stepped out of the house and I did. I would have been in that fire. And for those of you who feels like this isn't something that could be paranormal, I'm going to add in the other story about my second encounter with fire. The second time I got into a fire... I was actually living in a house at the time that actually I know for a fact was haunted. On this particular day I had been boiling some water on the stovetop. I had to run downstairs really quick. My house wasn't very big so it wasn't like I was going far. I was downstairs no longer than five minutes and as I headed up the stairs I noticed smoke coming from the bottom basement doors. As I opened the doors up slowly not knowing where the fire was. Then I noticed smoke coming from the kitchen. Ran into the kitchen and literally half of my kitchen was engulfed in flames. To this day I'm not really sure how the fire happened, nor was the fire department. I was boiling water on the stove and somehow it turned into a huge fire in my kitchen. That particular day, if it had not been for my boyfriend, literally putting the fire out with his bare hands and burning himself all over, we probably would have had our whole entire house burned down. But he was not about to let it happen. So we did get to put the fire out. But it was thousands of dollars worth of damage. And we had to clean it up and pay for it. And because I was renting at the time, the situation also seemed paranormal to me. Because there was no way for that fire to have gotten that large that quickly. There was nothing around it that should have caught on fire. And it certainly made it that large of a flame or have that much fire in a short period of time. And my pot that was on the stove was literally water. So I don't know. People can call that a coincidence, but I look deeper into things because of all the paranormal things that I've been through in my life. So that's the end of my story. I wish there was a warning on talk to text, because it's like the Olympics to read it. But I appreciate the story. Thanks. Me and my brother got caught in a time vortex. So I guess I'm going to do one more story before I go to sleep tonight. So to give you context to the story... I live in Wisconsin where the summers are nice, but the winters are brutal. When it snows here, it really snows. When it's cold here, it's really cold. This particular day, my brother had come into town. He works out of town and he frequently travels from state to state, so he's not home very often. So I picked my brother up from the airport and he was staying at the house for the weekend. Then I had to drive him to another town that next day. This way, he'd be able to fly out from there and head to his next destination. After he had got to my house, it started to snow. But we weren't really worried about it. It snows all the time. 
Like I've said, I've driven in plenty of snowstorms, plenty of whiteouts. I'm used to driving in snow, so it's never been something that I feared to do. I honestly would rather not drive in the rain before the snow, like that's how used to it I am. So the roads do get very bad here, and they do get very slippery. We get black ice and all types of conditions that make it very difficult for people to drive in. Okay, so, on to the story. So that Monday my brother needed to get home, but it was snowing really, really bad and I really didn't want to have to drive an hour away on the roads. And that particular drive was mostly straight roads where you didn't really get stops for miles and miles. It was later in the day, but I knew my brother needed to get back home, so I decided that I would take him. At first, things weren't so bad. My brother started driving first about 20 minutes into the drive. It started to get pretty bad, and I could tell that my brother was definitely getting nervous driving. I suggested that maybe we pull over at the next place so, you know, I can. We'd switch drivers, and then I would drive the rest of the way. I really couldn't see much either, but one thing I noticed was a big sign, and on the left of the road it said, Welcome to a particular town. Which I can't really remember the name of, but it did say, Here time is always on your side. I've tried looking up this town and finding it. I've tried driving that way again, which I've driven past at least seven more times since then. I can never find the sign, however. This particular night I see the sign, and when I see it, I think to myself, like, that's a really weird thing for a town to have as their motto, but okay. Then I thought about, like, time is not on my side at this moment, clearly. But about two minutes after that is when we stopped on the side of the road because my brother really had to use the bathroom. And there wasn't bathrooms for miles. We needed to still switch drivers. So as we pulled over, I remember my brother hurrying up using the bathroom and jumping back in the car and saying, Man, snow is looking really crazy right now, isn't it? I said, Yeah, it's looking kind of crazy. But we started driving as I was driving. There was no other vehicles out on the road. It was clear that people were not trying to be out at this time because of the weather. It was pretty much pitch black aside from the snow coming at us. On the reflection of our lights as I began to drive, the snow kind of changed, became different. It almost turned into like a vortex. That's why I said a vortex, because it looks like, well, we were in the middle of some type of snow cyclone. The snow was coming at us in like a swirling pattern, and it looked like we were almost driving through like a whole snow tunnel. But I didn't want to stop. I didn't want us to have to get stuck anywhere. And I was only supposed to be about 20 minutes away from my brother's destination. So as I got there, my brother asked me if I wanted to stay. I was like, no, you know, it's 7 o'clock. I really want to try to get back home as soon as possible. So I jumped back in my car, put on my GPS, and I noticed the time is 7 o'clock. I get to driving, and I'm not really paying attention to the time, obviously because I have to drive with the lowest speed limits at the time, I was probably going 25 and at highest the speed limit. I was probably going 50 and 75, so not really fast. So I obviously knew that I needed to add on about an extra hour of time travel-wise because of the speed that I was going. But when I got home, it was 10.30 at night. Couldn't account for what had happened all this time. And I had somehow lost it. Like, how did I leave somewhere that was only an hour away at 5.45, drop my brother off by 7, and still somehow not come back home till three and a half hours later? I wasn't even driving slower than I've had to do before, and that was on the very same drive. I may have only ever added on an extra 30 minutes to my drive, but three and a half hours just didn't make sense to me. Again, I tried to do all the research I could to see if I could find anything about people having a time motto for their town, or perhaps people caring about time specifically in their town. I could not find anything. And if any of you knows about a sign like that in Wisconsin, and a town like that, let me know. Because I was using my Google Maps GPS, and it's like I took a wrong turn and just figured out the way home. Check my GPS, and there's no construction to where I had to take a different route or anything. 
So yeah, I'd call that paranormal, or at least unexplainable. Whichever you prefer, it happened. Funny Spooky Story I just had a funny experience the other evening. When I was young, I moved in with my then-boyfriend. We rented an apartment in an older building. There, I had my first encounter with something paranormal. After my boyfriend went to bed, I would often stay up to read or watch TV. Two of three times, I suddenly heard an old man breathing. It was very clearly an older male. It sounded almost exactly like my grandfather breathing. I didn't want to believe that it was something paranormal, so I went close to the TV, which wasn't on. I wanted to see if there was sound coming from that. I opened the door to see if it was the downstairs neighbor who was snoring. I checked the heater for sounds and went to the bedroom. Then I was listening to my boyfriend breathing. It wasn't any of these things. I didn't find the source. Then I went to bed. Then a couple of nights ago, I suddenly heard breathing in our living room. My first thought was, it's found me after 30 years. Then I realized that my boyfriend didn't take the baby monitor with him, at least when he went to bed. And now at least I'm going to go to bed. See ya. Hopefully tomorrow. I'm going to be dreaming of commas and periods. <laughs>